for many, many years, all the way back to the days when Ansel Adams photographed that same scene. So um, what I was doing was nothing original. And uh, what, I, what I decided was with macro photography, images that you'll see today, or if you see on my website, those are all my only original images because they are subject matter that was eventually erased by the environment. It no longer exists, can't be photographed again. So all my images are original as an artist and a photographer. Uh, I like to feel that when I show images, they're originals. Now, as far as cameras go, um, for macro photography, you don't need an expensive camera. For about nine years, I used the D7000 Nikon camera body. And um, uh, a guy named Bill Fortney, who has uh, been in the photo business for 40 years, worked for Nikon. He says, Mike, how come you're not using our professional cameras? He says, I know you're using a D7000. It's a good camera, but how come you're not using our professional bodies we sell? I says, Bill, I says, 60% of the people that come through my workshops are using cameras under $1,000. I said, if I use your $6,500 camera, those people leave my workshop saying, well, Mike's images look really good because he's got a professional expensive camera and maybe they have a camera that's uh, under a thousand dollars and they feel they won't get images as good as I get them if I'm using an expensive camera. Uh, I chose that D7000 because it was around that one thousand dollar price range uh, and and it was to show people that you don't have to have an expensive camera for macro photography. Now I'm not going to tell you that that camera would be a good choice for someone shooting action shots that needs high frames per second uh, or maybe someone that shoots uh, mostly in low light conditions and need high ISO with low noise. Uh, maybe my inexpensive camera wouldn't do those, but for macro photography, we don't require that. So I could take a $500 entry level uh, camera body and produce images that I'll get published in magazines. So you don't have to worry about whatever camera you own, you'll be just fine. The brands, I've seen every brand uh, out there in my workshops over the years, they all do great work. Um, as far as megapixels, you know, of course, now you, you can buy a, a, an inexpensive camera and have 24 megapixels or 26 megapixels. So, uh, you know, that's uh, not like it used to be when I got my first digital camera it was six megapixels, you know. So no problem with the megapixels. Uh, the macro lenses, they, they come in short range, mid range and long range. Now in the top right corner, you'll see a short lens that's on the camera body. And I'm going to photograph this rose of Sharon flower. Now, if you know that flower, it's a pretty good size flower. It's not a small flower. And I want to fill the frame with that flower. So you can see in the upper left corner, that's the shot I took with the 60 millimeter. And you can see how close I had to get to that flower to fill that frame. Now the image below that is a longer lens. That's a 90 millimeter Tamron lens and that's on the uh, camera body. And now in order to get the exact same shot, the same framing like I did with the 60 millimeter, I had to back away from the flower. Uh, so this is what we call working distance. So when I went to the longer focal length of the 90 millimeter, I gained some working distance between me and that subject. The image on the bottom, that is a 180 macro lens, telephoto macro lens, and you can see I have to get quite a distance away to get that framing like I did on the 60 millimeter. So I've got a lot of working distance with that telephoto macro lens. Now, why is that important? Well, let's say that that flower was now a dragonfly or a butterfly or a live subject. Wouldn't be too happy if I'm using a 60 millimeter macro lens and I'm in 12 inches from its face, probably going to fly off. But with a longer telephoto macro lens, it has a much greater chance that it's going to stay there and I'm going to be able to capture it. Now, most people end up in that mid range in the 90 millimeter, the 100 millimeters, the 105s. And the reason why most people end up in that mid range is because the price is usually uh, in the price range they're willing to spend. Get into the longer, more telephoto lenses, you got to spend a little more money. So, most people end up with the Tamron 90s or maybe the Canon 100, Nikon. 105 or the Sigma 105. I want to talk about the most important thing that you have to have when you go out to shoot macro photography. If you don't have this, you're going to have some issues. This is what's called a dame's rocket flower. And you can see the petals on the top portion there are kind of a pink color. They're not supposed to be pink. They're supposed to be purple. When we are out shooting in the daytime, uh, maybe high noon, when you get some sun hitting your subject, you may get some uh, some color wash, uh, you might get some issues with the sun hitting your subject and causing issues with the colors. But this was shot on a cloudy day. 
So even on cloudy days, there's enough intensity of light from overhead and also the clouds reflecting in our subject that'll cause our subject to lose some of the color. Now it's mainly on areas of the subject that are running parallel to the sky, okay? So what you need to do is get yourself a 12 inch diffuser and uh, they do make them in larger sizes. I think they have 20 and 22 inch, but uh, I've never had anything but a 12 inch and it works just fine. And it actually collapses down to about four inches and fits in my pocket. So uh, I like the fact that it's compact. Also, I'm usually shooting single flowers and I only just need enough to cover that one flower. Once you put that diffuser over that dame's rocket I just showed you, it gets the color back to the natural purple it's supposed to be. So you see the image on the left, no diffuser, image on the right with the diffuser. And again, this is on a cloudy day. Most people assume a cloudy day, you already have a big diffuser up there, the clouds. But there again, there's enough intensity of light coming off those clouds and reflection that would cause uh, your colors to wash out. Now, on that same cloudy day, I was walking down a trail and I happened to look to my left and I see this leaf and I could see the top part of the leaf, the color was gone. And again, that's the area that is parallel to the sky. Now, the front of the leaf has, has tipped down to a 90 degrees to the sky and it retains its color. Once I put the diffuser over top of it, I can get the color back on the top. Now, it's not as intense as far as darkness as it is in the front of the leaf, but there's enough color on the top now that in post-processing, I can darken down the top of the leaf to match up with the front of the leaf. Whereas with the uh, leaf on the left side, uh, without the diffuser on there, you can see there's, there's no color. It's gone to white, and I wouldn't be able to bring that color back in post-processing. So um, real, real simple thing. Uh, and again, cloudy days, you may need to use this. Now, on a sunny day, I am diffusing my subject 100% of the time. I do not let the sunlight hit my subject. Three things happen when the sunlight hits your subject. It can wash out colors, just like it does on a cloudy day. It can wash out colors. It can alter the colors. It can actually change the colors when it hits it. And it can create shadows in areas that I might not want shadows. So I want to just a nice, soft, even light. Now, with the image on the left, that sumac branch is uh, being lit by the early morning sunlight. And what happened when that sun hit it, it altered the color. It turned it to a more yellowish green. It's not supposed to be a yellowish green. Once I put the diffuser between the subject and the sunlight, you can see the image on the right side. That's the natural green it's supposed to be. So again, sunny days, I'm diffusing 100% of the time. Uh, cloudy days, depending on the subject, depending on how it's uh, you know, positioned to the sky. And uh, I'll be able to tell right away when I look at the subject, whether it's getting any color wash or if it's, uh, if it's okay. But get yourself a 12 inch diffuser. It's the most important tool that you want to carry with you when you go out in the field. All right, so I want to cover some of the different types of subject you can shoot, just to give you ideas and things. Now, most people are flower photographers, okay? If you went on to any macro photography group, which I'm on, involved in like 22 groups on Facebook that I post in every day, and uh, you'll see mostly flowers being posted. And it's probably because flowers are easy to find. Uh, we can shoot them in our homes. We can shoot them in our backyards. You can find them at botanical gardens very easily. So they're very uh, uh, subject easy, very easy subject to find and photograph. They don't move. They don't fly off on you. So they are easy to photograph. So most people end up being flower photographers. Now, most people typically shoot flowers like you see here. Uh, a flower in the top third of the frame with a stem under it. Now, if I was to go on any of the flower sites and show you some of these images that are being posted, they're typically in this style, uh, flower in the top third with the stem under it. And I've got a bunch of these, you know, I mean, I, I shoot them this way too. But it's boring, okay? It's basically just documenting a flower. It's not creating anything artistic with the flower. It's just documenting the flower. So the nice thing about macro photography is that uh, we can get in really close on our subjects. And when you get into the inside of a flower, it becomes much more interesting and more artistic. So it's not to say that you shouldn't shoot the flower like I just showed you these last four or five slides with the flower in the top third and the stem under it. Again, it's okay to shoot that. But once you've accomplished that, don't keep repeating it over and over with the same flower. Do something different with it. So it's a nice thing about macro lenses is we can get in really close. So we fill the frame with the subject. It's much more interesting. 
something like that there. Now we get to see all the interesting details that's going on inside of that flower, all the nice veining. Uh, and it's a scene that most people don't get to see. Most people see those flowers, as you saw in the boring shots, is the typical top third of the frame with the stem under it. But when we can get inside those flowers, we can really pull out some interesting details. Now, these are done with just a standard macro lens. Now, most macro lenses are, are not most, but all macro lenses that are true macro lenses will say they are in the one-to-one -one magnification. So what that means is that uh, when you take that lens in your camera and you are shooting a subject and you get to what the lens says is the minimum focusing distance uh, of that lens, you have hit the one-to-one -one magnification. Now, the minimum focusing distance to the subject is from the sensor inside the camera, not from the front of the lens. A lot of people think it's from the front of the lens. It's actually from the sensor inside the camera to the subject. So my Tamron 90 says it has 11.5 inch minimum focusing distance. So once I get that to that minimum focusing distance to that Tamron 90 lens, I am in the true macro range of one-to-one. -one. Now, when you're shooting at that one-to-one -one in that minimum focusing distance, you're actually capturing what you have framed up, the actual size of that subject right onto your sensor. So let's say there was a ladybug in that scene that I was shooting at one-to-one, -one, uh, it would actually reproduce the actual life size of that, that ladybug right onto my sensor. So again, that is the one-to-one -one magnification or shooting life size. And that's what pretty much every true macro lens goes to that one-to-one. -one. So another shot of a flower in close. And again, so much more interesting when you get into all the artistic design of these flowers. That was just in a pot at the Chicago Botanical Garden. I just got the camera over top, set it up the tripod and shot straight down at the flower in the pot. And these are just very tiny areas of these little flowers that I'm shooting inside. But more interesting, this is a black-eyed Susan on a frosty morning covered in frost. Mike. Yes. Really quick, there was a question about uh, f-stops. I'm sure you're going to get into it, but it came up. Um, these, When I'm shooting in tight on these shots like you see here, all these, I am shooting at the highest f-stops. Okay. I'm going from anywhere from 22 to 32. Because when you're getting in super close like you are and you're getting into that one-to-one -one range, um, you're getting very, very little depth of field. And so uh, when, when uh, we're shooting subjects, as you see here, these images where I want everything in focus, I'm going to the highest f-stops of 22 up to 32, okay? And you can see everything's in focus on these. I'll show you another style where we're shooting the opposite end and the smallest f-stops. But when you're shooting in this close, you should be at 22 or higher. Nice rose okay. shot here. Uh, I may as well throw these at you too. Sure. Um, do you only use the native lens or do you also use tubes or magnifying front filters? Uh, hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't do use tubes. Always, and do you, always use a, do you always use a tripod? Always, 100% of the time I'm on the tripod. Now, as I, I, you know, the lens will go to one-to-one. -to -one, so anything you see here, you can shoot with the uh, macro lens. Uh, I do use the Nisi close-up filter, which I'll get into later in the program. And it will show you uh, how much smaller of an area that I can capture with that Nisi filter attached on the front of my macro lens. So, but uh, uh, no, I don't use anything else other than the macro lens and the Nisi filters. And that gets me in super close to anything I need to get into. Uh, most of all this is easily done with just a standard macro lens that you're seeing here. And again, all these are shot at 22 or higher. Now, those of you that are skeptical about shooting high f-stops, okay, because you've heard of the, the dreaded diffraction. Um, diffraction is nothing to worry about because you'll get some slight diffraction at high f-stops, but we have sharpening tools in our in all of our post-processing programs, whether it be Photoshop, Nick Software, Topaz, Smart Photo Editor, they all have a sharpening program. And what those are designed for is to sharpen your images. So any slight, uh, and I say slight because people tend to let you think that your image is gonna come out blurry shooting at high F-stops and that's just not the case. 
any slight uh, softness you do get, uh, you can correct with the sharpening tools, just like you correct things like colors and exposures and contrast with your, with your post-processing tool, sharpening tools will fix any slight softness. Uh, another little fact here is uh, if, if you uh, go to Amazon, there is a book called Group F64. Look it up, Group F64. And in 1932, Ansel Adams, Edward Weston, and seven other photographers started a camera club in California. And that camera club was called Group F64. And all those photographers had bought lenses that went up to six, F64, and all their shots were taken at the highest f-stop of those lenses. That's why they called the Group F64, because that's where they were shooting their images at. So hey, if it's good enough for Ansel Adams shooting at the highest f-stop, it's good enough for me. This is actually a very rare flower. It's a cactus that only blooms once a year. And I just happened to be at the botanical garden the day it bloomed. All right, now this is, makes my point right here. Now I post on, like I say, over 22 macro and flower photography groups on Facebook. And I posted this image. And you can see the comment on the left side there, or the right side, I mean. Uh, that lady uh, had said, I like it. It's different. Not the same single flower for surrounded by a fuzzy, out-of-focus background. And so what she's saying is she notices that everybody's posting images, like I showed you earlier, flower in the top third, stem under it with a fuzzy, uh, out-of-focus background. And here I come along getting into this flower, showing all that fine detail with that macro lens. And she says, I like it. It's different. Not the same single flower surrounded by a fuzzy out of focus background. So that's what I'm you know, pointing out to you all that by getting in close on these subjects, we can get into the fine details of them that are more artistic than just the, the standard shot of a side shot of a focus uh, or a, a flower in the top third and the background out of focus. Soft focus flowers now, instead of shooting at the highest f-stop, we're going to the opposite end. And this is a style that macro photographers tend to like. I will tell you this, that uh, my experience with showing images like this, uh, where you have very little in focus and a lot out of focus, most people don't understand it. Macro photographers love it, okay? Uh, there's uh, some female photographers, Kathleen Clemens, Jackie Kramer, uh, Ann Belmont, uh, Jerry Jones that does Lens Baby, and they do a lot of this uh, soft focus flower photography, and they get big followings because macro photographers love it, all right? It's very artistic. But from my experience, when uh, you show it to people that are non-photographers, non-artistic type people, the first thing out of their mouth is, why is it out of focus? <laughs> so um, if you do this style, which is a very cool style, it's a lot harder to do than getting everything in focus. Um, it, it's, uh, uh, it, it's something that isn't well received by a lot of people. I've had people tell me even in their camera clubs, when they had competition night, they would enter a a soft focus flower shot. And even the judges who are photographers would say, well, I wish it had a little more in focus, but that's not the style that you're after when you're shooting this. Now, when I shoot this style, what I do is I typically like to shoot into the side of a flower and I, uh, I, I have the tips of the petals or whatever petals that are closest to the front of my lens. In other words, this edge of this petals right here is the closest to the front of my lens. And I'm gonna focus on that area there because I want the focus to be in the foreground of the image, uh, you know, uh, because it's easier to spot because everybody looks at an image, they need to have something in focus. So if it's in the foreground, it's in focus, uh, it's easy to spot. And then the softness of a 2.8 or a 3.5, depending on your macro lens, that would be your smallest f-stops. Uh, you'd want to shoot these with the smallest f-stop, get that little bit in focus, and then you'd get that softness into the flower in the background. If you were to take this front area right here and you know, and then focus into this center area of the flower right here, you're gonna have a big old blur in the front of your image. And so it's a, just a big blob there that's out of focus, it's not as appealing. So uh, you wanna try to get the front part of your flower that's closer to the front of your lens in focus and then let it soften down into the background. And again, this is just a real artistic style of macro photography. Uh, but uh, I, I always like to warn people that if you're going to shoot this style, 
not everybody's going to understand it. Again, you can see the just these front tips are the areas that I'm focusing on. Smallest f-stop, 2.8, 3.5, depending on the macro lens. Same here. Right here is the closest to the front of my lens. And this part right here. And all these are shot indoors. Um, that's much, much easier when you can set them up in your home, uh, you know, control the light and everything and, and control, of course, the flower where it's not going to blow around in the wind. Um, but uh, these, these are all shot indoors. Now, plant life. Um, when I started uh, quite a few years ago, uh, I was um, showing a lot of plant life in my photography. And a lot of the people were shooting flowers and bugs. And that's okay. I, that's what most macro photographers do, flowers and bugs. But I came along and I started showing a lot of really cool plant life and different things that you can photograph. Because I like to expand people's thoughts on what, what they can photograph outside of just flowers and bugs. So you got to get down low. That's one thing. You know, most plants are usually low to the ground. So, um, and, and it's not easy on the body. I will tell you that. It gets harder and harder for me to get down and get back up. <laughs> uh, these are May apples. They're going to be starting to sprout here in another three, four weeks here in Michigan where I live. And when they start to emerge out of the ground, you'll see these really cool little uh, clumps of leaves that are, this is only probably about three, four inches above the ground. And again, with the macro lens, you're getting in super close on that guy, but it's a very cool little artistic plant when it starts to come out of the ground. Now, as it grows and fills the, uh, the forest floor, you have these big, large plants. I like to go and shoot them after a rain. So you get all those raindrops on them. It just makes it more interesting because if you remove the raindrops, you just have these three green plants. It wouldn't be as interesting, but the raindrops is what creates the art on there. And then underneath that canopy, it looks, you know, each, each one of these plants looks like an umbrella and underneath the umbrella is one single white flower. That's it. it produces just one single white flower. Very difficult to shoot because you have to get up underneath that canopy to photograph. Um, I just wander around the woods looking for things. So you can see down here, there's a plant that has these little red berries. And so I've just got my tripod set up over top and capture those little red berries in the leaves. So there's all kinds of cool stuff. Ferns are a lot of fun to photograph. I like to go out and shoot ferns. Now, uh, again, if you're in the spring of the year, like we are in Michigan, uh, you're gonna get the fiddleheads. These are the little fiddleheads that pop up out of the ground. And I found this pair that were facing each other. And then I took a skunk cabbage leaf, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And I positioned the skunk Cabbage leaf behind it, shot at a high F stop to get it all in focus. And this guy's, you can see how they just curled into these little, little coils. And then that thing will open up and it'll be a full size fern eventually. This was not shot at the highest F stop because you would see all that stuff in the background and in focus. But I just got the front of the lens parallel with the front of this right here. And I shot this at an F8 just to get that in focus and still get some soft. Uh, look in the background of the ferns behind it. Now, when you go to botanical gardens, many times you'll see these large plants, like here you see this a century plant. Uh, it's a desert plant. And I never want to shoot up into the upper parts of it because you're going to have gaps and it's going to come through where you're going to see all this nasty background behind it. So what I usually do um, is fill the frame. So I want to get in here and photograph down inside there where the interesting abstract pattern is of that plant so that way i'm not shooting into the plant and, and and getting the background that's behind it i'm filling the frame by going down in close and uh, pulling out those abstract patterns these are the skunk cabbage leaves um i just did a video on skunk cabbage it's on youtube and it uh it's I, i've just got the plant as they're emerging out of the ground little tiny things coming out of the ground but this is in the summer when they're fully developed their large large leaves now you'll see some of these uh where the leaves are kind of a yellowish color remember i talk about the sun will alter the color of a subject well that's what's happening uh the ones that are not being hit by the seas uh, by the sun are the natural green but then when the sun hits it turns it to a yellowish color like that now when you backlight these leaves with that sunlight you get this amazing pattern of veins coming out of it 
so I like to go out there and the sun's got to be at a low, low angle. So right at the horizon, as it's coming over the horizon is the best time because it's coming across the, 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 the swamp there where the leaves are and it's backlighting all the leaves. And so the sun is directly behind them and you'll get this amazing pattern of leaves. Um, just another tropical plant, like the little curls in it, got in close. And you can get down on the ground and shoot uh, dew and grass. Another thing, just a simple thing like dew and grass. I can go out in my yard and shoot this. Uh, but you'll get cool little patterns and what they call orbs, all these little orbs. Those are all water drops that are in the background that are blurred out. So usually what you want to do is focus on one water drop and one blade of grass. And then with, again, with the small f-stop, 2.8, 3.5, maybe a 5.6. You get that little drop in focus that you're that you're focused on, but you get this nice, soft, dreamlike look in the background. And again, all the drops that are in the grass behind it are creating these little round white orbs that you see here. They're just out of focus water drops. It's pretty cool. Here's another one, same thing. I just focused in here. And like I say, you get all these cool uh, blades of grass that are blurred out with little water drops creating orbs. So it's just simple little things like that can create beautiful artwork. And this is just some ornamental cabbage that was in a, a field. Uh, a, a, it was a, a farm that sells flowers for people to come in and pick flowers. And they had these ornamental cabbages. It was a frosty morning. And I just captured the nice frost that was down inside there. Hey, Mike. Yes. I'm going to quickly just ask a couple of questions that came up. Okay. And I'm going I'm to I'm blend them all together. Sure. Which is your metering, the metering type you use, your metering um, uh, matrix. All right. And do you use manual focus? Yes. I always manually focus. I will say, though, what's really cool about my new mirrorless camera that I just got is you just touch on the screen where you want to focus and the camera focuses where you want it. Um, whereas in the past, I would always have to look through my viewfinder and use my focusing ring and manually focus but yes i did manually focus on everything and uh do you focus stack no um i can get it done with one shot um so i don't have any need for focus stacking all these images that i shoot are done with one image that's it now um if i'm in a situation where i'm shooting where there's a lot of clutter behind my subject then I will put a background behind that subject and photo with the background. Anyone interested in to learn how to make backgrounds that are natural looking backgrounds that you can use behind your subjects, you can go to YouTube. There's a video that I have there called creating background, uh, creating printed backgrounds for macro photography. It's creating printed backgrounds for macro photography. And it'll show you how to make your own backgrounds. And so uh, a lot of times, a lot of these shots you saw here, uh, where I focused on the flower, but blurred out the background. That was just done naturally out in the field. But um, uh, if I have a, if I'm in a botanical garden and there's a lot of clutter around the flower that I want to photograph, and I can't blur out that background naturally, then I will post a background, put a background behind it, and photograph, and I can shoot it as high as f-stop as I want, because again, it's just going to hit that printed background uh, that is behind it. So um, yeah, I, I, I get everything done with one shot. There's no need to be focus stacking. Seed heads, another fun, fun thing to shoot that creates beautiful artwork. I like to go out in the fall when the milk weeds are popping and you'll get all these interesting little seeds that are gonna pop out of them like that right there. And it's just amazing all the different types of art that you can find in these milk weeds as the seeds start to emerge out of there and float around. And get in really close on them with your macro lens and and that's just a real tiny area of seeds with hairs and little little dew drops on them and there's one that's opened up and the seeds are just kind of going wild and dandelion heads you guys got dandelions where you live you can take a dandelion pull off the seeds so what i did was i pulled off all the area in here so that it exposed the center of the head with all the seeds how they're attached to the head and another one where I took off all the seeds and just left this little area that you see right here. Now these that you're looking at have backgrounds behind them. That's a, there's a background behind that. Same with this one here. 
Same with that one. So these are all areas where I photograph. Again, there was a lot of clutter behind them. So I just popped them in our backgrounds. And once you put that background behind it, you can shoot as high as F-stop you want, get everything in focus and not miss anything. Now this is a goat's beard flower and the goat's beard produces a seed head that looks like a dandelion, but it's way bigger than a dandelion. It's probably seven, eight times bigger than a dandelion head, but it looks like one, but it's huge. So you can get right into that flower and capture this really cool stuff that's inside of that with all the little hairs and all the lines that are going all over. Really fun stuff to shoot. Again, with that macro lens, you can just, you know, push it down inside there. Now this is a soft focus style, right? You can see I've got very little in focus. So I just focus on the stem area right here, use my small left stop. So again, you get that soft focus on the, on the seed head rather than everything in focus like you saw in the previous images. And again, this is done smallest f-stops, 2.8, 3.5, 5, 6 in the range there. Another close inside shot of the uh, goat's beard head. And this is a goat's beard head too, but uh, this image on the left here, that's the original on the camera. And what I liked about it was I liked this little area right here, this kind of, it was different. Never seen anything like that, so I photographed that there. But in uh, Smart Photo Editor, they have this one filter that mirrors so that it mirrored the area on the left side on the right side. And it created this like spider looking thing. And when I post it, everybody goes, what the heck is that thing? Um, so yeah, I just took the original on the left side and then I sharpened it and mirrored it. And you can see uh, what it came out pretty cool on the right. Uh, another goat's beard and again, uh, different stage where you, they've, they've lost a lot of the, the little seeds. Um, this is a clematis bush that I came across out in Colorado. And it had these really cool um, little, I guess they're seed heads that are coming out of the bush. And the sunflower on the left, that's a, a dead sunflower, the backside. And I just cropped out this area right in here so you get this and there was frost that morning uh and you can see all the little white frost that's on the uh back side of that so you can see there's a lot of cool stuff to shoot more seeds here uh i don't remember what the heck that was laying on but <laughs> those are maple seeds fall out of maple trees all right critters so i'm sure you want to know about critters because uh if you're not a flower photographer you're probably a bug photographer and a lot of people are into bugs so uh, I don't go out during the daytime to chase these bugs around when they're flying around. What I do is I go out early morning, daybreak, all right, right when the sun starts to pop. I'm out there in the cold mornings. Usually the best time I find is about, you know, mid 40s to low 50s. That works really well because it's not too cold for me, but it's cold enough for the bugs so that at nighttime when their body temperatures lower down, uh, to the point where in the morning, when I find them, they cannot fly. They literally cannot fly. Um, you might have heard macro photographers that will take bugs and put them in the refrigerator, and the refrigerator lowers their body temperature down to the point where they cannot move. And then they'll take them outside and put them on a flower and photograph them. But this happens naturally out in nature. When the temperatures drop down at nighttime, their body temperatures lower down. And when you find them in the field, perch somewhere you can set up your tripod and photograph them without them flying away it's so much easier than going out in the daytime when they're flying all over the place you only have maybe a, an hour and a half or so be before the the you know air temperature warms up and the bodies warm up and they'll take off so you have about an hour and a half but you want to be out there right at daybreak and you want to search fields where you've seen these things flying around during the daytime in those fields they have to land somewhere at nighttime they're in that field you just have to search them out so on this particular morning, I'm walking through this tall grass and I happen to see these two butterflies over here on the right side that are on the grass attached to it. And over on the left over here, you see there's a dragonfly in there. So I can go ahead and photograph that pair of butterflies and set up my tripod, take my time and photograph them. Uh, and then I can go over to the left there and photograph the dragonfly. So I had two of them right next to each other. So I didn't have to search too much. They're right there. But uh, it's so much easier when you get out there again on those mornings when they can't fly because you can set up your tripod, you know, work your camera angles, take your time and uh, capture these guys without them taking off on you. And you can get in super close on them. You can see like here, this is a saddlebag 
some kind of saddlebag dragonfly. And this guy had frost on his back. This was actually shot with a 60 millimeter. When Tamron came out with a brand new 60 millimeter lens, they sent me one to go out and, you know, they wanted some images for advertising. And I shot this of this bee. And again, it was a cold, frosty morning and he had crystals on his back and he's just sitting on that golden rod, not going anywhere. So it was real easy with my 60 millimeter to get in close and photograph them. Uh, Black eyed Susan, you can see a little spider there over in the lower right corner. He's hiding in the petals. And this little bee has got an interesting haircut. Looks like a punk rocker. Now, this is uh, something that happens with hoverflies. When I'm photographing flowers, I'll get these hoverflies that'll fly into my scene as I'm photographing the flower. And so uh, this guy flew in. He was sucking on this little stamen thing or whatever it is right there. And I just happened to click off a shot right when he was in midair. And another one, same thing. I'm photographing this uh, napweed flower and this hoverfly come right into the scene as I was photographing the flower. So sometimes you get lucky and they come to you. And this is something that I, I was hoping to find years and years. It took me till I uh, ran into a guy that found this uh, millipede in his yard and he brought the millipede in and it curled up. This is, this thing is big. I mean, it's, it's a big millipede and it's, it's pretty fat and big. Uh, and my uh, goal was always to photograph down in here, get in the macro lens in really close on them. And uh, there's the shot right there. So I'd seen this shot done many, many years ago. And I thought, boy, if I ever get a chance to photograph one of those, I want to do that same shot. And this, and this is exactly like the shot I saw somebody else posted many, many years ago. But I never thought I'd ever run across one of those things. But uh, luckily, a friend found one. Now, you can go to the beach and shoot. Uh, there's all kinds of fun things on the beach. You can shoot shells. I don't like to shoot just the shell laying on top of the beach. I want to find stuff like this where you see uh, this has got one big shell here. And then this little blue shell fit inside of that one. And a little yellow shell fit inside of that one. That's pretty cool. And then the sand blew in and filled it in. And over here, we've got the large shell with the smaller shell inside. So that's much more interesting and artistic than just a plain old shell laying on the top of the sand. So I usually like to look for ones that are kind of inter intermixing inside with the sand and stuff. Feathers is another one. You'll have all kinds of shorebirds on the edge of uh, beaches on the water that, that are dropping feathers. And I always look for feathers when I'm out there. Don't shoot the feathers that are the veining is perfectly aligned. Shoot the ones that have some separation in the veining like you see here. Or like this one here is a wild one. Look at that one. That's crazy. I'm going to so pop in real quick just to sure. ask. There was, because going back to the millipede and then some of these, uh -huh. what are you doing when you're processing these images? Because, for example, the millipede had a color and then... The photograph had this very striking color. Of yes, it does. So I use a program called Smart Photo Editor, and it has over 7,000 creative filters. And so basically what I'm doing on a lot of these images, I'm just using filters that are creating all that unique look that you see there. So yeah, also, it's, it's just filters. Also, do you, do you carry any sort of little toolkit of like tweezers and... Yes. Yeah, scissors. Yeah, tweezers. scissors, tweezers, brushes. Yeah, things like that. Little inexpensive things that don't take up much space in your pack, but uh, sometimes they come in handy if you need them. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of accessories that you can carry with you. There's another one. This was shot in Iceland. Interesting feather. Now that's a filter. Like you see, the rocks look a little weird. It's just a filter that created a kind of a motion in the rocks in the background. Mushrooms, another one's fun. You go out there, you can find dead tree trunks that are laying on the ground or even standing tree trunks that have mushrooms growing out of them. And you get some cool mushrooms to shoot. There's a couple that are just growing out of the grass. And the underside of a large mushroom, cool veining. And look at that one. That's a pretty cool one. Look like can-can dancers where they're bent over. Beyond one-to-one. -one. Okay, so now I've shown you, you know, different examples of things that you can photograph. It's a lot of fun to do. And um, now we want to take it to another level. So we want to go beyond that one-to-one -one and go into higher magnification. So Nisi has this really cool filter. It's, it's a piece of glass 
all right, that screws on the front of my lens. So I use it on my, my macro lens. My macro lens already goes to one to one, and then I can screw that onto the front of the lens. And it'll take it into a higher magnification. In other words, it'll shoot a smaller area that I could sh possibly shoot with my macro lens. So I'm going to get into really tiny areas with this. Also use their rail. Uh, th this rail is one of the best rails I've ever seen for the money. Now, um, about 15 years ago, I bought a rail that cost $150, and it was a total piece of junk. It was sloppy, and it didn't work very well. And so um, when I heard that Nisi had a rail, and I heard it was, I think it was like $125, I'm like, well, it can't be too good, because I remember 15 years ago, the lens that I had, or the rail I had was uh, $150, and it was terrible. So I, I thinking a $125 rail can't be too good, but this thing is built like a tank. I'm telling you, it's a really good tank, uh, real good filter. And it, um, it, it is very, very easy to turn and, and move the camera back and forth. And it's just, uh, I was really shocked and really happy when I got it. Um, very, very impressed with the quality of it. All right. So I want to show you a video here of stuff that I was shooting with this lens, uh, this filter attached to my macro lens and the rail. So when I decided to start doing some really in close micro photography with this uh, screw on close up filter on the front of my Tamron 90, uh, I knew that I needed to shoot this vine here that's growing on the side of this tree trunk. Uh, this is a pine tree and has this interesting vine that grows all the way up to the top. And in this vine, there's all these little legs that are coming out, all these little lines, all right, that are branching out away from the main part of the vine. And uh, there's all kinds of cool little patterns in there. Now, in the past, you may have seen me shoot this with my 90 millimeter macro in the one to one range. But at that point, I was covering an area that's about an inch and three quarters long of that vine. So I wasn't in, in really, really close capturing a larger area. But I always thought it'd be nice to get in really tight and, and pull out some of those really interesting little designs. And, and of course, this uh, close up filter is going to allow me to get in really close. Uh, I'm covering an area that's only about a little over an inch, and that's how small it is. Now, what's nice again with the rail is that uh, I may need to move this uh, camera slightly in or slightly back from the subject for framing, and it's very difficult to do with a tripod to move just fractions. But with the rail, we can just crank it a little bit in, a little bit out, and uh, we don't have to worry about moving the tripod, so it works really, really well for this. Now, there's there's some distance between part of the bark that's kind of pulled away from the tree trunk and the area that I want to photograph, uh, probably about a quarter of an inch. And, you know, when you're shooting in some really high magnification, your depth of field is really tiny, okay? So I'm going to vary the f-stops like I always tell people to do. So I'm going to shoot an f-16, 22, 32, and even up to the, I think it goes up to 45 when I'm in this close, all right? So uh, that way, uh, if the lower one works, the 16 works, gets it all the focus, that's great. But if not, then I'll go with the higher F stops. And uh, I know that uh, at the highest one, I I'll for sure will get everything in focus. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and set up here. And it looks pretty good. All right, so I'm pretty excited, you know, something new. And, uh, and this system here, I think it's gonna work really, really well for me. So. Um, I'll look around. There's some other cool patterns in these, the bark of these pine trees, and uh, I'm sure that there's some little tiny patterns that I, uh, I haven't seen before that I can pull out of here. So, all right. in the last clip I was shooting a very large vine that was on a tree trunk on this pine tree and uh, now I'm on a different one it's got little skinny skinny vines and uh, there's one here that's real skinny it's not even an eighth inch wide and uh, off of it there's these little uh, uh, little figures that are coming off of lines and uh, uh, cool little subjects that uh, I can photograph here now these are really tiny I mean real tiny they're probably only three quarter inch wide by inch, half inch high, real small. And so I'm gonna to need to move in a little bit closer. So we're gonna 
take our rail. And, and again, like I said, it's nice having the rail that I could just slowly crank it in until I get the framing I like. And uh, it would be difficult to do with a, with a tripod to get in that close on it. Uh, a little too close, so let's back it up a little bit. It's a real precision. And then we're going to frame it, uh, focus it. And now there's uh, about a quarter inch depth from the front to the tree trunk. And I want to make sure all that's in focus. So again, like I said, I'm going to be shooting those high S bounds. I want to make sure that I get it all in focus. All right. And then there's another nice one up here, a little higher. Just these little patterns that are coming off of that vine that are really interesting. I'm going to back this one up. Pretty cool. And then focus. I think I gotta go back just a little bit more. And again, these are tiny, tiny little areas I'm shooting. Very nice. All right, so this is not a good day to shoot, uh, sunny. And I got in here real early before the sun came up, got in the woods so I could do a little bit of shooting, but now that sun is coming up and the open fields, I'm not gonna bother with today. So we'll have to make a trip back, hopefully tomorrow, clouds will come back. Uh, yesterday was a perfect day out here, but uh, today's not gonna work. It's getting real windy. And uh, as that sun gets up, starts heating the air, um, gets too windy. So. I'm going to pack it up, head home, and then I'll come back out tomorrow. We'll maybe hit the open field and see if we can find some things to shoot out there. All right, so to give you a reference on how small that subject is that you just saw in that photograph I posted of the vine with the little, like, looks like tree branches coming off the vine. I'm going to put my forefinger next to that little area right there. Okay, now you can see that little area that I photographed that you saw is not much bigger, if any bigger, than my fingernail of my forefinger. Okay, that's how small that is. That's pretty tiny. So in the last two clips, I was shooting tree trunks, vines and tree trunks, and uh, as I mentioned, it was getting sunny out, and, and uh, I was going to head home. Uh, Get up this morning, beautiful clouds, perfect condition, little slight wind, but not too bad. Uh, I, I wanted to get in here and photograph one of these seed pods from the uh, milkweed plant and get it inside those uh, where the seeds are, are, are still encased in the pod before it opens and, and the seeds start to fly around. So you see like all these seeds over here. And uh, that's typically the shots I would take as the seed pod with the seeds hanging out. But now I want to get inside and photograph the seeds, how they're encased inside the pot. Now this lens, this close-up lens attached to my Macro 90 allows me to get really tiny. I'm talking about a half an inch by three quarters of an inch, maybe somewhere in that range. Uh, really, really small area. So I had to uh, use my plant. You can see, if you can see here, my plant's attached to my tripod and onto the stem of the plant to hold it so it stays steady. And then I'm gonna get in here and I got it set at, uh, at a uh, 22 and I'm going to shoot a 32 and a, and a 40. All right, so that's really, really small area and it's showing off the little seed heads that are in there all encased and then some of the hairs off of one of the seed heads. And that's pretty cool. Now, um, I'm going to keep searching because there, there's some more of these pods here. This one here is kind of nice. Nice little group right here, and I might shoot that one too. And uh, whatever else I get here, I'll post it at the end of this clip here and show you the uh, different ones that I shot. But really nice. Uh, again, get in real close. I got the rail to adjust, fine tune it uh, to get it into position. And 
and then, and then shoot. So I think this is going to turn out pretty good. So it's late October and there's not many flowers left, uh, at least in this area I'm in. Just these little tiny, tiny daisy type flowers. And uh, they're even kind of at the end of their cycle. So there's not many on here that are worth shooting, but I did find one right at the edge here that I can get in real close on. And again, um, yeah, I'll, I'll bring a camera shot in and show you what that looks like, but it's really, really small little flowers. And so uh, I'm in really close and I'm pretty much filling the frame with the flower. And then uh, there's a little bud that's alongside of the flower that I've got positioned kind of up in the two thirds of the frame. So uh, I'm focusing on the center part where the yellow is in the center of the flower. And then with a uh, amp, let's see, 22 is about as high as I'll probably go. Um, on the F-stop. Move it over a little bit, there we go. So that looks pretty cool. It's amazing how small of that how small that flower is. And I'm getting most of it in the frame. Uh, actually, the pebbles are extending outside of the frame a little bit. So that's really, really a tiny area. So um, I'll look through these other ones here. Maybe maybe I'll find some more uh, in the field here and 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 try it again. But uh, I think this one will probably come out pretty good. So we'll see. All right, I have this little tiny leaf. It's probably only about a little over an inch long, and it fell and got hung up in the uh, in the bark of this pine tree. So I'm going to get in here and shoot that right now. All right, so I moved the camera in, made my fine tuning adjustments on the rail, and uh, I'm going to fill the frame with this little leaf here. And. Where are the F stops? Um, twenty-two up to forty. She went a little bit darker. All right. Yeah, pretty small area. Um, it's amazing how these leaves, you'll see them falling down. I don't know if you see one down here, but all through these pine trees, there's leaves that fall down and they get hung up in the uh, bark. And so that's always interesting. Again, it's one of those little, you know, creative artwork from Mother Nature. All right, see how this comes up. Now, a lot of the dead tree trunks in the parks that I shoot that have all this moss, green moss, or fungus that's growing on these dead trees. And uh, I always thought it was kind of interesting little patterns that they create. Uh, so I'm going to get in and shoot this little area right here. Now, it's only about three quarters of an inch long, you know, three quarters of an inch long. So uh, that's pretty small. It's much smaller than I would typically shoot with my macro lens, but with that filter on the front of the uh, macro lens, I can get in and uh, fill the frame with this uh, subject here. So for many years, I've searched out these old tree trunks, has this green moss, lots of it all packed on top of these trunks, and they're all over through the woods. There's tons of them. And uh, I've always seen some little tiny patterns that I thought, well, they'd be kind of interesting to photograph. But again, with my traditional one-to-one -one macro lens, uh, they were generally smaller areas that I could photograph. So with the uh, 
Also filter, I'm able to get in really small in this little tiny area here. And as I mentioned in the previous video, it's very small, maybe three quarters of an inch long, maybe only a quarter high. So this allows me to get in really close. And uh, as I said, with the rail, it really helps because I can just easily crank this to get the camera closer or farther away, just fractions, because uh, you know it would be very difficult to try to make adjustment with the camera to get into the uh, framing that I want. So I'm gonna shoot this at a 22, and then I'll vary. And it's a pretty flat subject and I'm parallel, so probably won't need a lot of depth of field. Looks pretty good. And uh, as I usually do, I'll shoot multiple f-stops just to make sure that I get uh, the amount of focus that I want. So I'll go ahead and search out. There's just tons and tons of this green mossy stuff that's growing all over. And uh, I'm gonna have some fun looking for little interesting patterns of this uh, fungus. All right, so uh, as you can see, you can really get into some really tiny stuff, and that's a lot of fun. Um, you, you, your your uh, focus is a lot different when you're shooting into really tiny things. Um, it's it, it, but it, it's a challenge, and it's a lot of fun, and, and you come up with some pretty cool stuff. Now, I also use the uh, close-up filter indoors, and I collect um, all kinds of subjects. And you can see I have boxes full of them. I use them in my workshops and my macro conference each year for people to photograph these things. So these are examples of things that I brought out of the box that I could get inside and shoot. Now, uh, the images that I'll show you were just tiny little areas within this these pocket watches. Now, you know how small a pocket watch is. Um, it, the, I'm photographing little tiny areas in that pocket watch and little patterns in this agate and then little patterns out of this. And also right in here, a little tiny pattern right out of there. Um, so much smaller than I normally shoot with a macro lens. Uh, but I just get, you can just get the camera right over top and just shooting in my basement. And I, I used a little light to add some side lighting to the subjects, but, uh, this is the agate, just little patterns in the agate. And that's that uh, Nautilus, sliced Nautilus shell. And just some gears out of the little watches. I mean, little tiny areas in those watches and some of the little hairs, the fine hairs of the feathers. Yeah, it's just so much fun. And you're just going into a different world than you normally shoot. All right, so um, I want to end with just mentioning my macro photo club i started this about four years ago we've got over 2500 members from 28 countries and it has over 260 instructional videos on macro uh teaching you how to do what i do uh videos kind of like what you just saw in this video here but there's over a hundred of them me in the field shooting all different subjects and then there's over 50 of them is just equipment uh, there's about 30 some on uh, post-processing and there's about 25, I think, on composition. So a uh, lot of really good information that you can learn how to do this. Uh, it's got a lifetime membership is uh, $99. You only have to pay one time. So it's not like other instructional video courses where you have to pay monthly fees or yearly fees. You only pay it one time and you're done. You'll always have access to the videos. We also have other benefits of the club. Like we have a Facebook group where you can share your images on there and uh, communicate with other people in the club. And then we have sponsors that uh, we have that give away products each month so that, uh, you know, members, I do a raffle and somebody wins something. So it's a, it's a really uh, great instructional program that you can learn from. If you're interested, go to tinylandscapes.com. You see at the bottom, that's my website. And when you get to the website, just look at the top and you'll see some links. And in the center, it says Macro Photo Club. You click on that, it'll give you more information about the club and then uh, how to sign up. So, okay, Jim, if you want to come back in. Hey there. I, uh, it, the, the terrific. Thanks. Very, 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 very different from what um, we presented before, because we tend to get very myopic in our landscape photography uh, topic. So uh -huh. it was really great. This is, Thanks. I think, only the second macro photography um, uh, 
uh, session that we've done. I do want to say something. It was um, on my mind to say this mm -hmm. during, during your presentation about the Nisi close-up lens. Uh, so if you guys would hang on for just one second. You know, we... Um, what Mike has done with the uh, Nisi close-up lens and several other photographers that we know is, is that they've taken the lens to a place that um, really wasn't where we were aiming it. it. It performs beautifully, but our thought was that so many of you probably already own a 70 to 200 or a 75, 300 um, zoom lens. It's a very common lens for, um, people to buy when they when they first get into photography they'll have their initial 28 to 70 or 24 to 70 then they buy a 70 to 200 or 75 300 to do sports and portraits and stuff and the design behind the um the uh nisi close-up lens was for a very reasonable amount of money and for something that's super compact until you can justify the cost of a macro lens, that this would be a way for you to step into macro photography, retaining very, very high quality, but not having to spend a lot of money. And we brought these lenses out on the market and they've, it's, it's absolutely one of our best sellers. Um, but when you add it to macro lenses, what it allows you to do is just incredible. I mean, look at some of the uh, unbelievable pictures that Mike got pointing a camera at a tree. I mean, while you were watching him shooting it, it was like, what the hell is he doing? He's just like <laughs> taking a picture of a tree and you find the beauty in nature is in the minuscule. It really is. Yep. So it's pretty phenomenal. And um enjoyed this tremendously and i would like to offer that if anyone you know we we're kind of open-ended here if you would like to turn on your camera and turn on your mic and ask any questions of mike sort of one on well not one on one but in front of the group please feel free um i see karen has a question she's intimidated and clueless when it comes to lighting and flash i don't use a, a, a flash never have all my images you see on my website are shot with the natural light that's available. Just like you saw me shooting the things out in the field. Never use a flash. I don't use any type of flash outdoors. But Mike, you did, in fact, in the last little uh, frame clips, uh, show that you were using a uh, light in the studio for yeah. accident. In, in my basement, I was using the light as like a side lighting to create a little bit more dr dramatic feel in the subject matter. But when I'm outdoors shooting, I'm just shooting with natural light. There's no, uh, there's no flash system. So you don't have to worry about, she said she's intimidated by flash. Well, you don't need a flash. You can do all this without flash, just with the natural light. Great. So um, uh, that's it. I'm giving a, uh, another minute or so for anyone to raise their hand and ask a question. And all we're getting is a bunch of thanks. No one's thanking Andrew. We wouldn't be, you wouldn't even be seeing us. I did. <laughs> did you introduce Andrew? <laughs> I, I, Andrew was on in the beginning. Oh, okay. Cause I, I was, for some reason I was getting, oh. I was getting knocked out of the system. I had to keep entering back in. I kept getting <laughs> knocked out somehow. <laughs> I have something on my screen that says Emily Sandersfeld has um, raised her hand, but I don't know what that means. So, if that means I have a question. Oh, sure. there you go. Hi, Emily. Uh, there you go. <laughs> um, oh, God. You forget? I just had a brain Oh, um, now I, it's gone. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Maybe you it'll come back. Wait, with, with, um, oh, can you use a 77 step down to a 58 millimeter? You could use a 77 millimeter lens on a 58 millimeter thread. Using a 58 millimeter on a much larger thread can likely lead to, um, to uh, vignetting. Uh, let's just say every, every 77 millimeter uh, close-up lens 
comes with a uh, 72 and a 67 millimeter ring. We also, by the way, just introduced an 82 down to 77. That won't be a problem on a telephoto lens. And then the 58 millimeter comes with a 49 and a 52. And then there are adapters that are easily, um, that are easily available up and down the line. We have, I may as well pitch something else. We just came out uh, with, a, with stepping rings that are actually knurled and made out of brass. They're, um, they're a little more expensive. They're in like the mid twenties range compared to, I don't know, eight or $9 for a cheap aluminum one. Mm -hmm. but they're, um, you know, they, they won't bind and they're easy and quality. Mike, please talk about manual mode versus aperture mode and how you handle this. Yeah, most people can just shoot in aperture mode. The main thing is your f-stop. You want to make sure you get the correct depth of field. So if you want to just set up an aperture priority and just make sure that you get the f-stop you want, and then the camera will adjust for the shutter speed and get the exposure so you don't have to deal with that. Uh, I actually still shoot manual mode. So in other words, I set my f-stop and then I also set my shutter speed. So, but you don't have to do that. I mean, that's just the way I learned when I started out and I still kind of do that today, but uh, you can just shoot an aperture mode and then just make sure you control your f-stop and let the camera control the uh, shutter speed. Now, sometimes the camera will get fooled when you're in aperture priority with the lighting. And so then you would still have to make an adjustment with uh, compensation plus and minus to uh, adjust the uh, uh, the aperture, or I mean the lighting and that, so or the exposure. So, um, but most of the time the cameras are pretty good about getting the exposure properly uh, done. Uh, but your main thing is you want to be able to control that f stop for your depth of field. Now ISO um, depends on your camera. Now with my uh, D7000 camera, I was shooting at uh, 1000 ISO. Um, I got a new Fuji mirrorless camera, and I'm shooting 2000 ISO and getting clean images. So yeah, I have no problem because, you know, when you're shooting at high f-stops, you're going to have a little slower shutter speeds. And you can see in those images I shot, even when I was shooting at high f-stops, I was getting a fast shutter, uh, but I'm shooting at a 100 uh, or 1000 ISO. And then on my new mirrorless, now I'm shooting at two, 2000 ISO. Um, uh, Jim's asking about the uh, Fuji uh, for macro. I, I'm using the uh, Fuji uh, X-T30 Mark II, and I use the Tamron 18-300 to 300 lens on that, and it's working fabulously. It's an amazing setup. I love it. Super sharp shooting and uh, almost no diffraction. I don't even see any diffraction when shooting at the high f-stops. Uh, and that 18 to 300 will actually shoot into a very small area. Uh, a lot of these zoom lenses nowadays have the ability to focus in pretty close on our subjects. So that's pretty cool. Um, I thought I saw another one. Uh, what focal length? Oh, what is the focal length? How are you liking the Fuji for macro and what lens are you using? Yeah, that's what I just said. I, I, I like it a lot. And, and I do, uh, I, I'm, I, I've only been, I've only used it a few times um, because I just got it, but I really, really like it a lot. Mike, you were talking about uh, uh, the backgrounds. Oh and yeah, there it is. I was, that. That's what, that's, that's what Emily wanted to know. Right. <laughs> I know. I just happened to see that I was looking for it. Um, yeah. The, uh, I had mentioned that if you want to learn how to make the backgrounds, I have a video that shows you how to do it out in the field. And uh, you just go to YouTube, uh, type in Mike Motes, and you'll find my channel. And then search out the video that's called Creating Printed Backgrounds for Macro Photography. And it'll actually show you how to uh, uh, shoot subjects out in the field, blur them out, and then print them and you'll have backgrounds that you can use when you're out in the field shooting or you can use them indoors when you're shooting too but yeah just go to youtube hit mike moat's channel and then uh, uh, look up the video that says uh, creating printed backgrounds for macro photography all right are, there? are we covered do we are we ready we're gonna let mike get back to what he was doing and uh I'm going to go home and have dinner. It says, can I use the close-up filter with the 105? Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think the Nikon 105 is still, I think it's 62 millimeters these, these days if yes. you have the VR. Jim, if you don't mind, uh, I'll just jump in. The 
58 mil close up is the best with a macro lens. The reason is, is because the 58 is actually a five times diopter, whereas the 77 is a three times. So the five times will give you a ratio of almost two to one at a, with used with a hundred mil macro lens. So it's the perfect combination, the 58 uh, close up with the, the 105 Nikon, the 100 Canon, uh, or the 105 Sony, I think, and um, just use a step down ring. There's no vignetting with those three macro lenses. Yeah. Yeah. The it's lens is cool. real sharp. I mean, uh, images that I shot with it, it works great. All right, folks. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Thank you very, very much. I'll be in touch with you in a day or two. Okay. And, um, Sounds good. Thanks for those good. who came out. Thank you very, very much. And, uh, We'll uh, hopefully see you online soon. Oh, I'll be there. <laughs> okay, take care. All right, thanks, Jim. Thanks right. to all who showed up. Thank you. Bye-bye.